dark save for light being cast from the big tv screen and the imminent sunrise that's teasing the one starry sky with whispers of morning hey george hey lions how's it going uh you know i'm feeling pretty shiny like so shiny yeah like uh like you all have all of the exact same skills and abilities as like a non-shiny version of yourself but you're just a little bit rarer that's funny because I was going for Moana, but you went to Pokemon. Ah, yeah. Yeah. See? <laughs> <laughs> so, so many different shinies. Yeah. I seriously <laughs> thought about like, um, maybe, maybe I'll like sing a little piece of it. And then, uh, I decided not to do that and I didn't. And, and we ended up in this delightful misunderstanding. Woo. Yeah. So, uh, what do we, uh, what do we play? We played. Okay, I'm going to actually look this up because Shining Force is one of those games that Wikipedia tells me it has a subtitle and yet it's like not really on the box art or anything. But there's like a million billion games in this series. I don't know if you realize that. I didn't realize that. I, I didn't realize it because I, I, I also didn't realize that there is a very, very intense debate on whether or not Shining Force or Shining Force 2 is the definitive Shining Force. Like, yeah. And there is... The people feel strongly about this. Yes. And also, apparently, they re-released some of them on the Game Boy Advanced. And there is those people also hate each other. Like the people who like <laughs> the Game Boy Advanced version and the people who are like Genesis purists, like they also don't get along well. Um, supposedly, the uh, the subtitle after the colon uh, is The Legacy of Great Intention, which is not great. No, it's the legacy of it. So, I mean, that, <laughs> the problem with Shining Force fans and Shining Force 2 fans is they're natural enemies. Like Shining Force <laughs> fans and Shining Force Game Boy Advance fans. Or Shining Force fans and Shining Force re-release fans. Or Shining Force fans and Shining Force fans. Damn Shining Force fans. They ruined Shining Force. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get to go to that particular well often. That's a good one. Uh, I know, right? One of my favorite Willie quotes. Um... <laughs> We played the original Shining Force on the Sega mm -hmm. Genesis, uh, which I want to say came to North America in July of 1993, but it was originally released in March of 1992 in Japan. And the only reason I say that is because knowing that this game technically was originally made over the course of 1991 and then was released in 1992 helped put a little perspective on my feelings about the visuals and some other things, which we'll get to. But like when you look at it and you're like 93, just two years before the N64 was getting shown off, like really, but then, you know, you, <laughs> you scale that back to 92, which means development was happening in the end of 91. And you're like, Oh, okay. All right. And I mean, they first, <laughs> they first imagined the visuals in 1990 and that person was born in like the seventies. So, I mean, when you compare it to like the seventies graphics, <laughs> yeah, that, that it's, that it's great. Um, yeah. When the, when the genetics was being pulled together for the person that would eventually make shining Force, then yeah. 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 I mean, really you, good actually. Yeah. And when you think about how uh, ugly their parents were no, it's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I just, I think it matters because this game, uh, went on to have like a million billion sequels and you can tell this was the small team first outing kind of like the original final fantasy where they were like oh we don't know how many more of these we're gonna get and then it turned out people liked it and they went on to have like a million billion sequels that are of varying quality just like final fantasy um so my uh nostalgia goggles for this game is uh i played this when i was fairly small a little bit and uh have not touched it again since then but it's been on my list of um you know like movies that you feel guilty when people talk about them and you don't know like if you've never seen the godfather and someone like makes a godfather reference and you're like haha i only get that because of the simpsons or whatever right or th like those kinds of things where you just feel like i'm supposed to have this pop culture touchstone Shining Force for me is one of those games and, and one of those series where I like Final Fantasy Tactics. I like 
broadly speaking, strategy RPGs, and this game is considered a classic among those. So like the fact that I have just like this brief exposure way back and and I never really like sank my teeth into this game, let alone the rest of the series, just always kind of made me feel like every time someone's like, oh man, I remember Shining Force so fondly. And I would be like, yes, I also <laughs> had a Sega Genesis. <laughs> What, what what other titles would you like to discuss about that? I mean, I could I, I could talk about Shining Force, but you know. But um, I would rather talk about Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, there is now culturally a difference between Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> and Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Hedgehog. You know, like, those are <laughs> it's like true. They're, their own things now so if somebody said like i really like sonic the hedgehog i'd be like oh yeah cool somebody's like i really like sonic the hedgehog i'm like are you are you serious because you that's a weird you, that's weird like i mean and and, and i don't want to like shame anyone or anything like that like if you're into whatever but th- that's some of the stuff i've seen like you so sonic is like one of those doors that when somebody said like if there's a door labeled weird sonic stuff you just <laughs> You got to either brace yourself before opening or just know that that's not a door that you personally need opened. Um, for me, my nostalgia experience for this is uh, about ugh, about 15 years ago. Yeah. No, uh, six, seven, 16, 17 years ago. Um, I met this, uh, this, this one guy uh, in college, right? And, um, and he then sounds he and handsome. I, he, he, You'd think that, right? But, and considering his parents, um, <laughs> uh, I know your parents listen to this too. <laughs> yeah, you, you, your, your parents are very attractive. I don't know what went wrong. Um, so, uh, anyway, so uh, long story short is uh, I was doing a podcast with this guy, and uh, we decided to you know start doing like after you know after episode material where we would record it and post it for people who are a certain tier on our uh, Patreon subscribers, which people should absolutely like and subscribe and all that kind of good stuff. Um, all of that being said is uh, while I was, while we were debating on what game to play next, um, I believe that you said, uh, well, what we could play is shining force. If you're not a fucking coward. And that does uh, sound accurate. Yes. <laughs> and that was the first time I had ever heard of this game. So, uh, yeah. And, and so I was like, uh, sure. I mean, can you come at me like that? So, uh, so that, that's my nostalgia experience for, for this is that I was, I was challenged to play it. And, and just to put that comment in perspective, which I absolutely defend, like I'm not, I'm not trying to soften it or explain it away, but the context of that comment, uh, was we, are planning uh, after this episode to play another fairly long uh, kind of RPG experience game. And so the, the context of that comment was we would be playing two fairly long RPG experience games back to back. Right. So um, you personally are a coward, but also the situation was fraught. <laughs> it was, it was fraught. I tell you fraught. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we do jump into those uh, super early 90s visuals, uh, we do need to shill a little bit. Um, I need to actually just change this heading in my notes to just say shill. <laughs> what, what does it say? It says promotion. Nah. <laughs> yeah. We're shilling. It, yeah, I mean, it's okay. I mean, we, we have never... I mean, it, if you're not going to change controls and mechanics to gameplay, then at least change... <laughs> is to shilling That's, yeah see this compromise yeah, see? we're, both, yeah, we're yeah. collaborating on the podcast yeah. right, <laughs> workshop you know <laughs> uh but yeah so uh you mentioned our patreon which people should absolutely check out uh different tiers have different wards i think every tier now has you like you get something for subscribing which is nice like people used to subscribe just because but now if like you've been holding off because you you want to get something in return for your money um every tier has some kind of goodness that you get in return um you know there's there's the twitches uh there's the twitters uh all those places where you can reach out to us there's the little contact button on the website there's the apple podcast reviews which frustratingly are still disturbingly important for people finding the show so um all those things all those lovely ways you can say nice things to us are are deeply felt and appreciated uh but we do like to take a moment to call out our 8-bit classics and 16-bit heroes uh one of our 8-bit classics john h 
a powerful amethyst. And our 16 bit heroes, Jacob K. A precise pearl. David S. A mysterious garnet. And Michael S. An elusive rose quartz. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Steven Universe lately. Yeah, I, I, I surmised <laughs> that you figure that one out, did you? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't want to say I'm as good as Sherlock Holmes, but like <laughs> it's it's close. It's close. Hey, you're Shamrock Holmes. <laughs> 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 it feels like it's it the have, Sherlock equivalent of Sanic. Yeah, the uh the deviant art for that can't possibly be worse, can it? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, like it's the internet, man. Like there's a seat for every butt and a butt for every seat. It's true. And on that note, I'm never going to look any of this up and we should talk about the visuals for Shining Force. Yes, let's do that. Um so the visuals are very very vibrant. You know, there's a lot of intense, very saturated colors. Um, and that's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a very strong choice, right? Um, I, I think that I would much rather any time, like for somebody to go with the, I'm going to use bold, intense colors that like catch your eye, then I'm going to use dull, washed out awfulness. You know I mean? Unless it's, you know, obviously Resident Evil wouldn't work with, you know, bold, flashy, all, you know. All Crayola crayon colors. <laughs> right, you know. Um, that being said, I will say from my seat at least, sometimes the vibrant colors, I did not feel that they necessarily did a good job making the characters, the playable characters, distinct enough from the background. You know, like I never really got confused. I always knew, you know, and, and on top of that, because it's a turn-based RPG, unlike in, uh, you know, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, <laughs> it was less like important for me to be able to make that assessment on on a dime but that being said, literally in the opening scene, there's your sprite and then a rose bed of colorful roses. And twice I like lost track of where my character was because when he would walk into the roses, it was just like hard to figure out where he was. So uh, I think a, I think a good choice to use the bold, vibrant colors. But I never really realized that uh, you got to tone that down a little bit with your uh, with your environment, you know. Yeah, or the opposite. There needs to be contrast, right? Correct. Like, if the environments are super vibrant, then maybe the characters can be kind of dull. Or if the characters are super vibrant, then maybe the muted colors can be on the environment side, right? Like, you you need to have, or, you know, a thick white outline, like something to create that kind of contrast. And I know, you know, the, the Sega Genesis uh, had a more extended color palette than what the Nintendo could do, and it's comparable to what the super nintendo could do um i don't honestly know which one is more powerful i've heard people argue both uh but there is something about genesis color choices that to me always screams sega genesis like Mm. i i can look at a game and i think better than chance like if it's a game i've never heard of and i've never played before with better than chance i could tell you if it was on the Genesis side of the arena or on the Nintendo side of the arena, because they just have like, I mean, fantasy star looks, it's totally different colors, but it looks just like this. Like it just has that same kind of bright colors without a lot of like consideration for how they will all work together (laughs) to communicate information to the player. And and I'm not saying like, Oh, these artists suck. I'm saying like there was a, a, tone among sega developers like people and this this entire series was not only was this a sega thing to begin with but like there were game gear games there were sega saturn games like yeah they went to the game boy advance later because you know sega was done with hardware by that point but like shining force was all in on sega hardware so there's a sega cd one right and they all have all the all the sega consoles just have this like everything is super bright colors there just isn't a ton of kind of environment character contrast um to me the thing that really stood out about these visuals is doesn't this whole thing look like a 1980s anime yes yeah very much so it it looks it's specifically like a 1980s anime because unlike um dragon quest 
it doesn't look like Dragon Ball Z. It looks like Dragon Ball, you yeah. know? Well, and, and Which to it, me, like, it, the, the shapes of a lot of the characters' faces evokes, like, Lupin the Third, right? Mm, mm-hmm. Just kind of that, like, tall, narrow, like, I, I don't know what it is, man. Just, like, I, I look at the character portraits in this game, and I'm just like, oh, it's kind of like a, an 80s sort of anime vibe. And your feelings about the quality of the portraits <laughs> separate from that style, I don't really like that style. I find mm. that art style to just be very evocative of like cheap phoned in low production quality cartoons where they were just trying to get any character to be successful so they could start selling merchandise. And so when I see that style, I'm like, ah, cause I, I just, <laughs> I have this like, unfortunately negative association with it. Um, that being said, I, I think the character portraits themselves are also kind of weird. Some of them are like, fairly highly detailed and you're like, Oh, this person is dressed this way. They probably have this sort of occupation or they're, they're this character class or whatever you might call it. But then like the King, like the first like leader you talk to, he's like three colors. It looks like someone drew him like under time pressure compared to the way they draw the other characters. Like there's just the, the portraits have this weird inconsistency of quality. Maybe it's because he dies. And so they're like, eh, you're not going to see him yeah. a lot, but there, yeah. there's just like the, the quality of the portraits are all over the place. And then on top of the fact that it's the style I personally have this like weirdly negative association with, I was just like, every time a character portrait came up, I was just like, eh, just, just be, just be a text box. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and also too, I think that, um, to, to kind of piggyback off of that is that one, I agree that, that a lot of the, uh, character portraits, you know, they were, they were kind of hit or miss. Yes, there was some telegraphing on uh, on what the the class is and what they would do. Um, that being said, I do feel that the character icons themselves um, did not do a great job telling me what that character did. Because uh, and and this and okay, so <laughs> elephant in the room. The the thing that this game suffers from the most, in my own personal opinion, is a a horrid case of not being Final Fantasy tactics, right? <laughs> I was talking to somebody about this game today and that is exactly what I said. Yeah. Is it, that's the, the, the worst thing this game has going for it is that it's not final fantasy tactics. Right. And I mean like no harm, no foul, you know, so it, it is unfortunate because, and we were just talking about this in the Galaga episode where Galaga is the internal standard. Like it is the game by which you measure graphics by, right. You know, so it's not this game's fault that I calibrated myself off of a game that I feel, you know, is, is, I mean, renowned to be like top tier. And I'm sure with the like intense uh, fan base that there is around this game that, that I'm not making any friends right now, you know, because I'm probably saying like the one thing that they've heard a million times, you know, and they're like, you know, well, no, actually it's not about, you know, it's like, okay, like, that's fine. This is just my own personal opinion. I have not thrown hundreds of hours at this game. So if anybody says like, well, you're wrong for these reasons, you're right. You're just right. If you have, (laughs) if you feel that I'm wrong and that this game is superior or inferior to final fantasy tactics, and you have a, a reason behind that, then you have spent more time playing this game than I have. (laughs) <laughs> and you're right. I, I already acquiesced. All of that being said is that just looking at the characters really quickly, I felt it was very difficult to quickly internalize what their occupations were. Um, and this is something that, uh, that they've talked about in, uh, in a number of different video game podcasts and things like that, where uh, they, they kind of say like you, if you have somebody who is, you know, six foot five, 250 pounds of all muscle and they're a spellcaster that's going to throw off your people because you don't have that visual affordance like those people are typically uh fighter types you know so while you can do that to deliberately subvert that trope you need to be aware that that's what you're doing you know so i will say for like looking at these kind of classes yes there are definitely some things where you could look at it and be like oh well this guy's carrying a sword and this person has a staff and yes that, that is true but because all of the kind of colors are 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 they're, they're they're not quite as well defined or well mixed mixed together. Like so, you have like the main character who has blue and green. You have the mage who has 
blue and green. You have the archer who is green. You have the um, cleric who is green. You have the centaur, minotaur, centaur, centaur, who front view does not look like a centaur. It looks like just a dude standing there, right? Yeah, the yeah, first so, like, time they that- go into profile, you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, no, I literally was, I was like, oh my God, wait, what? You know? <laughs> And actually, I don't think I even got that reveal. I think I got, because I think I just had him go straight up the first time. So I don't think I got it until it was the little combat cut scene. And I was like, wait, what? So I say all that to say, I don't feel that there was necessarily the, and all of that being said is that when you compare that to Final Fantasy tactics, right? You know, you can very quickly be like, oh, that's a monk. You know, the monks look like this. The ninjas look like this. The white mages look like this i mean compare the white mage to the black mage right both mages iconically different right um i did not feel that this game did the same thing and so if their goal is to make a tactics based strategy game uh it raises your cognitive load in the beginning because you have to internalize what each person is and what they do which means you're probably going to lose the first battle because you just sent your your cleric to the front lines before you realize that they were your cleric well and this is this is something that I, I don't know about the later games besides the later games have a lot of different things going on mechanically. And this game, uh, the, the strategies, uh, not, uh, super deep and you don't have, as far as I could tell, cause I, I wasn't able to finish the game. Um, but as far as I can tell, there are zero like generics, right? Like you don't have any like fighter or mage, like everyone is named, has a story ish, um, a portrait, right? A personality and a specific skill set that cannot be changed, right? You can't change the job of your mage Tau, for example, like the, the first spellcaster you get. Um, and the reason I think that that's interesting in your your critique about like oh i don't know what this person does it's like oh because you just met them but but this person this is all they'll ever do right so Mm -hmm. eventually like given enough time right a battle two battles half the game the whole game like you would eventually presumably be able to internalize that because even if the damage dealing spellcaster and the you know health restoring spellcaster don't really have job specific appearances which i agree with you they absolutely don't they have unique enough appearances to their character that you could say like oh that's tau and i now know from using tau in battle that tau does thing x right or like that's um the the hero the main character that you get to name like he's sword stabby you know generic hero number six right so like it by keeping the strategic flexibility and depth of the game a little bit more shallow you only have to deal with that ambiguity once whereas Mm -hmm. i I would argue final fantasy tactics actually has the exact opposite problem which is the face characters always look the same so when you send agrius into battle and for whatever reason you're leveling her as a white mage and then you're like agrius use your sword to oh crap you're a white mage right now (laughs) (laughs) right so like the 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 simpler mechanics which i have lots to say about but the simpler mechanics at least mean you only have to memorize what everybody does once and then then at least you're good the first time you got to figure it out through trial and error but then yep. you're then you're good and, and that's the thing is that I, I don't think that it's it's by any means game breaking it is though something where i and and to your point is is because everybody is their own unique human right you can't have them it, and with hey, with the hey, they're not all humans yeah <laughs> Oh, that's true. Sorry. <laughs> that was very insensitive. Um, but, uh, you know, so it would be very, very difficult if every single fighter, you know, every single fighter can't look like a fighter because there's 15 different, you know, people, individual people that, um, you know, have the those that that particular class. That being said, though, um, not to make this a critique about Final Fantasy, but to juxtapose it is that what Final Fantasy does, though, is they do give you those generics off the cup co- off the cup. So it's like you I think one other person, I know Algus is there um, because I had to spend a round dropping him every single time. Like that was the first thing that my hero did was turn to the right, punch Algus to to death, um, to unconsciousness, and then I could start the battle. Um, All that being said, though, is that so what that 
did was allowed you visually to say like, okay, this person's going to be a mage. This person's going to be a fighter. They look like mages and fighters, you know? So then when you start to get those named characters that you can make anything, you've already, you know, got a lot of the um, background to the game. You already know how to play it. You've done all of that, that mental legwork beforehand. So that way you can then kind of flourish with it. Whereas this one, it says like, Hey, here's, here are your heroes. They do stuff. Go figure it out. Um, not world ending by any means, but uh, definitely a crutch that I didn't realize how heavily I rely on people being kind of archetypally uh, cast visually uh, until all of a sudden I was like, all righty, just run up there and oh God, you're my healer. You know? Well, and it, it does play into kind of where we started with this about the colors feeling a little samey and not really popping because if your brain lazily is like, Oh, the, the green elfy looking person is my, my archer. And then not long after you get a green elfy looking person who is in fact a healer and you could reasonably, right. Send one of them where you didn't mean to. And they're pretty generous about letting you undo movements and stuff. But then like, if you've been slowly over several turns building a, plan where you're like okay i'm gonna put this person here this person there and then i'm gonna have the archer go up behind them oh crap that's my healer right like you can end up in a position where you're like oh i moved you know green square and i meant to move different green square and it's it's not game breaking it's not like i was routinely losing battles over this i'm sure you weren't either but it it does it forces you to think like I really just wish these characters were a tiny bit more distinct because their character portraits super mm-hmm. distinct in battle, like in the actual clash between like friend and foe um, super distinct, like silhouettes and they have different little movements and everything super, super distinct, but they're, they're, they're tokenized Sprite that you see on when you're moving around town or in the battles. Cause it's the same Sprite. Um, they, they need to pop more pop pops. And- the best word I could do. Like, like when an industry exec is like, it just needs more oomph. Like it, I know that's not <laughs> super helpful note, but that's what I want. Come back with yeah. another revision that has more oomph. Well, and, uh, and interestingly, so uh, as we were discussing this, I think I figured out the the problem with the, the poppin is because, uh, cause I, I was like, you know what? I want to look at Sonic, the Sonic, Sanic um, to uh, not Sanic, <laughs> just Sonic. Uh, to to kind of see uh, see why because I didn't have that issue with Sonic and with Sonic it's actually more time sensitive right so why why not a problem with Sonic but but a, a potential problem here and I think it's because it they don't have to be off limits but they have to be used very very sparingly which is the colors of your heroes can't be the colors of basically anything else you know or if it is it can be like an accent color but it can't be the flat color right you know so you look at sonic right um and it's interesting because on the 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 opening title screen right sonic is blue the water is blue and it's almost the exact same blue right that's fine you you're the you you don't need to do anything there right but then when you go to play the game the blue of the water in the background is a different color blue the blue of the sky is actually the same blue as sonic but you're never against the blue of the sky or you are rarely right. When you jump it, the camera changes that way. The the water kind of jumps with you, you know? Um, So all that being said is at no point are you against the same color. Whereas in this one, and I'm I'm literally, literally looking at a scene right now just to make sure I'm not losing my mind. Uh, Yeah. The archer who is green, the cleric who is green have the exact same color as the grass, which is green, which is why they don't pop, you know? So yep. I think that that's, that's the issue is they didn't say like, okay, these are the colors that we're using. These are the 15 colors that we're going to use for the heroes. Um, yes, that will make the heroes look a little bit more the same, but they will always pop against the background because we're not going to use any of those colors in the background. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of things that sound like throwaway notes, but I am deadly serious about how important these were to me visually. Um, okay. text go fast. Uh, this game is a strategy RPG, which means there is a crap load of on-screen text because everything you do generates text. 
you did this, it did this much damage. You were healed for this much HP. You got this much experience. You killed someone and you got this much experience and these many coins, right? There's just, there's tons and tons and tons of on-screen text. And not only can you set the text speed, but if you hold down like confirm, it blasts through the text, which is by modern standards, super not a big deal. But in 1992, most games did not give you this incredibly welcome affordance. And I I count it here in the visuals because one, it is staggering how fast they made it scroll on screen. Like instead of just flashing away to nothingness, it literally scrolls all the text the same way, just a million times faster, which is sort of funny looking. Um, but it, it makes certain things that would feel very visually slow and plotting and clunky feel wicked fast. Right. And, and that includes sort of the way like text boxes, um, open and close, uh, when it goes to the enemies and their, um, like turn, I guess is happening. Um, it, it flashes on them super fast. They make their choice like damn near instantly. There's no slow thinking or consideration. Like all those animations play out super, super fast. And I just, I always appreciate that kind of thing in games period when it's like, yeah, I don't care about this part. Just, just skip, skip as much of it as possible. I need this information. So you can't literally just fade to black, but like, just let's, let's move it along in a strategy (laughs) game. So much of the visuals is like God view, right? Where you are looking down on the battlefield from on high. So I don't need it all to look super realistic, right? Like just, just, just go faster. Just tell me what happened. Just communicate the information <laughs> yeah. about the battle that I need. Um, I mean, you literally play Dungeons and Dragons. So, I mean, like yeah. when you're playing an RPG, <laughs> you don't need, I've got my imagination, the theater of the mind. Uh, where I think that problem actually interestingly backfires is in combat. Um, it, every, every screen can be a battle screen, which I think is actually super cool. Towns, interiors of buildings, the overworld map such that it is, um, they, they can all be the, the set drop, uh, the, the backdrop for a battle. What that means is Battles happen on essentially the overworld map. And also sometimes you have to walk between towns on the overworld map, but you walk at full speed and you can walk over mountains and walking over mountains at full speed looks incredibly awkward and, and like jarring, I guess. Whereas slowly moving over them one or two squares at a time during battle is like, "Ah, I'm sending my units up through the goat pass so that they can sneak up on the flying bats and destroy them. But just blasting across the mountain range at full speed as if there's no collision because there's no collision like that. That was a place where I was like, no, no, make me go around. Like, yeah, I know Mm -hmm. it would be longer and I'm just going town to town and there's no random encounters and nothing's going to happen. But don't, don't just let me weirdly glide over the mountains because it, Now this visual feels awkward. I was really happy with the speed a second ago, but here it feels like it actually is sort of so visually unappealing that it's like, did did they forget to put collision into the, (laughs) into the game? Well, and also too, I think that in those situations that could very easily be fixed with like, you, you can get an item that allows you to fly, you know, and then you can fly between point A and point B, which a lot of games do. Um, and so if they're like, oh man, you know, having to get around these mountains is super annoying. It's like, yeah, that's fine. Make it super annoying for like a third of the game. And then, you know, be like, Hey, you finally unlocked the feather ball or whatever, you know? And, and, you know, now you can fly over these things. And it's like, oh man, that's super sweet because now I feel powerful because I can fly over this thing before. And I, I couldn't in the first place. So, uh, so yeah, no, that, that, that is definitely, I I know that (laughs) when, because it's the second battle where you get kind of kicked out of the first battle and then all of a sudden it's like fight on the overworld map. And I was like this. And to me, the the thing, like you said, going over the mountains was visually unappealing. And, and this may just be a me thing, but I was like, wait, wait. So one square is, is the entire dungeon I was fighting in before, <laughs> right? 
it is now represented by the map. Now, I could definitely see, like, you know, when you're walking on the overworld map, it's tokenized. The whole point is that it's a representation, right? But now I'm looking at my four characters. I'm like, so they're all standing like hundreds of yards apart from one another, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the whole point of the, the map, right? And now I'm going to watch my centaur just, wow, you know, just like clear, like clear, like hundreds of not thousands of yards in like six seconds because i'm assuming around in six seconds because it's always six seconds right and 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 lance this guy to near death i'm like when did i be i mean on battle two i am now near deific in you know my ability to to clear (laughs) that doesn't make any sense to me so that to me immediately pulled me out of the experience of having battles like that on the overworld map i did not care for that i do like the fact that you know you can have it in a town you can have it in a shop you can do anywhere but not on the overworld map the overworld map is a representation it would be <laughs> it would be like if if literally i said you know to you i i, I put out a map on the table i said like okay we're going to go from here to here and then all of a sudden you're like wait there's a battle and then i insisted that we stand on the map <laughs> you know like joey from friends like yeah, i gotta, I, go, into I the gotta map. go into my map <laughs> yeah so anyways, I, I agree with you on that visual, but for those reasons. So it's, I'm always fascinated when we notice the same thing for totally different reasons, <laughs> because my problem with battles on the, it's, it's not really the overworld map, but I mean, it looks and functions vaguely like an overworld map because you don't spend a whole lot of time walking around the way you would in like a Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, right? It's not that sort of overworld map, but it looks and functions basically like that um my issue with battles on those maps as opposed to like a town or a dungeon or like on a cliffside or the you know lots of fantastical locations you end up at um when you're on like the the generic overworld map between cities the cities are a pseudo realistic distance apart and the enemies are closer to the city you're trying to go to because they either got there first or they they went there intentionally to try and prevent you from going there, right? So now you just have leagues and leagues and leagues of empty nothingness between you and them. And you spend the first five rounds just slowly plodding over there because from your point of view, you were looking at like the individual centaur and you were like, my God, she's flying. Like she's going so (laughs) fast. And from my point of view, I was like on top of a building looking down at a snail. And I was like, that snail's never going to get all the way across the street. That street is huge by that snail standards. (laughs) So it's like, it's the exact same problem, but like, uh, it's like, you know, you can like do a dolly zoom with a camera where you like move the camera toward as you zoom out or you move the camera away as you zoom in mm-hmm. and it does like a crazy perspective thing. Like you were dolly zooming in one direction and I was dolly zooming in the other direction because we were looking at the same thing and having totally like opposite problems. You felt like this weird sense of speed and I just felt like there's this giant expanse of nothingness and it takes so long and everybody's moving so slow. So either make the world smaller or make the characters move farther on their turn. And don't get me wrong. I understand that in a strategy game, both of those changes would have a massive impact on how the battle played out. Fine. (laughs) Design battles that play out acceptably under those circumstances, because visually every time an overworld battle loaded and I was just like, they're way over there. They're way over there. Like, I'm just going to walk over there. Nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to slowly plod over there. And it doesn't, there's no like anticipation or build up. It's like just two to four wasted turns of slowly plodding across the map, which doesn't, I don't know what the point of it was. Like, it doesn't feel grand and massive and it doesn't feel like mechanically I'm getting time to strategize, which again, talk about later. It's just daunting. Like there, it's, you know what it is? It's like, um, it's like pre revolutionary war, British warfare. Like they're lined up on their side of the field with their muskets. And we're lined up on our side of the field with our muskets. And we're going to just slowly walk toward each other and start firing muskets. And if we started 10 feet apart, 
or 100 feet apart, the same thing is going to happen. At 10 feet, we're going to fire our muskets. <laughs> so if you start 100 feet apart, there's just 90 feet of marching. And then at 10 feet, everybody fires their muskets. So I think I, I, I think that's fascinating because basically we, we are in a weird way proving the assertion that there is no universal frame of reference, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, because that, that, that's basically the experiment we just did because I'm using the map as the frame of reference. And so to see an object move across the map at nor- normative speeds, like as far as the pixels go, I'm like, look at all of this distance they covered. <laughs> they are moving super fast. But then you use the centaur as the frame of reference and said, Look at how many rounds it takes for me to get to my destination. This centaur is moving very slow, you know? So it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, well, how fast are you moving right now? It's like, I'm not moving at all. I'm saying still. Well, I mean, except for the fact that I'm rotating on the earth, which is rotating actually very fast. And that's rotating around the sun, which is moving through the Milky Way, which is moving. It's like, so you're moving really fast or really slow or not at all. Or, you know, like it, it, it depends on your frame of reference, you know? So uh, that that's that that tickles me. I I enjoy that. <laughs> um, the one <laughs> the one uh, final throwaway note I have for visuals is um, not doesn't say yes or no. Uses he- head shaking. You know. And, yeah. And that's- yeah. The men the menuing is very early computer RPGs. Yeah, which is is interesting. Um, I, I don't feel strongly about it one way or another, but I I think that okay. I, I guess. Let me be more specific. I didn't like it, but I think it may be better. And I think the reason why I don't like it is because I, I'm just not used to it, you know. But the reason why is because it actually lowers, theoretically, it lowers the bar through which somebody could play it. Because Teddy can't very easily read yes or no, but he understands head shaking, right? You know, and he could look at that and be like, this symbol means items. This means this. This means this, you know, and, and those things kind of jive. Um it's weird then that they decided to lower that cost of entry on a very, very mathematically rigorous uh, strategy game, you know? Like, it's like... What, yeah, that, cause, that cause, feels a lot more... You're a silent protagonist, and this is a way to make it mm, feel like you, the protagonist, are responding, and I less... I think it's pronounced protagonist. Protagonist? Protagonist. Yeah. It, it feels more like that, and less like a an accessibility. How do we get this game to be more playable by a wider audience? Cause I mean, there's yeah. so much text, so much text. So for someone to have thought like, ah, if confirm and deny our little, <laughs> little hot head nod and head shake animations, then that'll bring be, in the younger set. It would be like, like, um, you know, t- teaching your dog to shake hands and then actually putting it into a high powered business deal. Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, like t- today I could imagine someone saying, oh, we're going to have the menus be really visual so that they're like less, it's less reading. It's a little more approachable at this time in history. And based on everything else in the game, I, I think it's more of just like someone thought it looked neat. Right. And that was the thing is because initially I was like, you know, oh, this is this is a really kind of cool idea to because anytime when you can like rip text and numbers out of a game and still make it playable. It's like, okay, well, that's, I, I look for that type of stuff uh, in games for Teddy because I look, I look for games for Teddy to play, which is fascinating because somebody will be like, oh, did you like, uh, you know, Dead Cells? Then have you considered Final Fantasy Tactics? And it's like, <laughs> what? Or or some other game, but where um, it in order to play it, you have to be able to read. And I'm like, you missed you know, algorithm, you missed the critical thing on this, which is that you do not have to read to play this game and you do to play this other one. So I was like, so when I saw this, I was like, oh man, this is, this lowers an entry point for Teddy, except for the fact that everything else about this game is completely unplayable for him. Um, so yeah, just kind of, uh, huh, you know, my, uh, my last note for visuals, um, which I didn't mean to be a throwaway note, but weirdly it's like actually not typed out in my notes here. Um, I, I think the best, visual like artistic visuals and in terms of like how well they communicate what is happening is those little battle clash sequences so uh, in this game when i go up and poke a dude with my sword i select the poke a dude with my sword you know menu and then it actually goes to a higher resolution 
um, kind of over the shoulder, like full unique little animation of me poking with the sword and the bad guy going arg when they like get hit. Right. And ditto for healing spells, damaging spells. The archer has their own. And remember, every character is unique. So each character, like if there's two healers, they have their own unique casting a spell animation, because even though it's the same spell, two different characters with unique sprites. And that sprite work is uh, pretty good. Like I think it actually looks pretty nice. Uh, I kind of like the, I don't even know what you'd call it. It's like a split ground where the enemy is on their own little background that's drawn and rendered for them. And you're on your own little background. It almost looks like you're standing on a plinth, like overlooking where they are. And it, it creates this kind of interesting visual effect. Um, it, it's nice. And uh, it's good that that's nice. Cause you're in that screen a lot. Every single interaction, every attack, every time you are attacked, every spell you cast, every spell they cast cuts away from the over over screen the battle map the the final fantasy tactics view and it and it goes into this little like canned cartoon and it it's thank god it looks nice because otherwise that would that would be painful right so i think it's it's very thoughtful that they were like we want to make the hits feel like you're hitting them we want to make when you get hit that it feels threatening and scary when you know big monster swings their club at you or whatever when fireballs are exploding like we want to make that feel visually spectacular and so i think they could not do what final fantasy tactics did which is have the strategic where are my people on the field view and that serve the combat needs so they cut to these little like vignettes excellent choice really and and a look that now that i know it's from this game i've seen other games copy this look and uh so oh so so you're saying that that this game was the progenitor of it uh maybe not the progenitor but certainly a very early example if it's not the progenitor so uh so i've got i've got a a a gameplay note that'll tie very nicely into that so we got to do visuals but but we got to come back to that because because this is this is gonna this is gonna be very nice for me (laughs) um Uh, audio then uh, audio uh i'm curious what how, how'd you so agreed completely visually really really important that you can just plow through the uh the audio what'd you think about the text crawling noise did you like that was that nice for you did didn't you enjoy bother that? me didn't bother me as much as you'd think because <laughs> because i felt a set and i i think i'm i'm starting to realize this is a big hang up you just for me. hate mario like i Don- hate Donkey Kong? mario so much no i <laughs> because you have to walk to play donkey kong you can't walk any faster or slower you have exactly that one speed and so you're just hearing that noise at that pace constantly with text scrolling noises not always but most of the time it ends up having a rhythm more akin to someone typing right? Which means there's like a little bit of break, right? There's and and it's break that is following the pace of the conversation. So if a lot of people are talking and they're talking back and forth, you might hear like, right? So like there's some almost like musicality to it. And even if it's the same sound effect, which this game does, right? Shining Force has just one text scroll noise. If I'm holding down the please for the love of God, go through this text faster button. I feel like, oh, yeah, I mean, this noise is kind of irksome, but like I'm I'm making this happen and I'm getting something in return for this. Right. Walking in Mario or in Donkey Kong in the original Donkey Kong is is not that it's like it's just a punishment <laughs> for playing the game and I'll never forgive it ever. Ever. Um, well, and also, too, I do think that that to to your point, um, is uh is that in in this game right you uh the the that but uh but uh that's supposed to represent somebody speaking you know um obviously the the trying to get voice acting for this would have melted the the the, the, the sega it would have melted the dreamcast so hard that it <laughs> went back in time and melted the genesis you know 
Um, so all that being said, like they, they can't do that. So they're, but at the same point in time, having nothing but hanging silence, it, it would be a little weird, you know, because it's like, I'm this, this person's talking to me. Um, I, I take it back. I don't think it would be weird, but it, it, to me, it didn't bother me because it's supposed to be representative of somebody speaking. Whereas in, and, in, and it, it became uh, normative. Right. Whereas in Donkey Kong, uh, people walking don't make that noise, you know? So mm-hmm. I think that your brain kind of calls out like, why is this noise happening? As opposed to, well, somebody's talking when people talk, it makes noise. It's like when people walk, they don't make this horrid squ- rubber squeaking on wet tile noise. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to call it out because, uh, <laughs> because I heard that. Um, so I liked the music. I definitely couldn't sing any of it or quote it to you. I didn't, you know, so I didn't love it. Didn't hate it. Um, I liked it. That being said is, uh, it does vary wildly by area. Right. Um, and that's fine to a degree, but like, and, and I was trying to think of like other games, like how they handle this. Cause I really noticed it here because literally you'll be walking around in the town. And it's like, do, 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 do. And you're like, yeah, no, this is kind of cool, man. Just walking around the town and then you'll just head up to where the castle is. And it's like, bum, 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 bum. And you're like, oh my God. And you like take two steps back. And it's do, 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 do. And you're like, wait, I mean, a part of me just kind of wanted to, to be the main character, like straddling that line. <laughs> And just kind of hopping back and forth, you know? Uh, but, and so I think that the issue is that there's um, no, there, there's there's no bridge, you know? Like, so there's no, and then I walked into another area where there was either very low or very muted music. Then I got to the area with the very intense music and that the two different musics, music styles are very, very uh different than one another right so in other games like uh legend of zelda things like that you know like let's take link to the past right when you go into a dungeon right a it's very clear that you're going into a dungeon right with this one you just walk north hard enough and then all of a sudden you're in the castle right um but then also too is it'll kind of there'll be a little circle they'll kind of go into you and and the music will duck out and then it'll come back in in this new area that you're in you know uh that that's better because this this was jarring <laughs> it it's jarring and it also feels like the pieces of music are different not always for the right reasons like the 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 music does not need to be that dramatically different between the first town and the first castle right like the the transition could definitely be smoothed out but if the pieces of music were just a little bit more thematically aligned where they felt a little more cohesive then the sudden transition might not be quite as jarring uh the issue i had with the sudden jarring transitions um was with everything you said i mean cosign that 100 percent, but also <laughs> um in battle the transitions are not only jarring but it really highlights the repetitiveness. So when you are fighting, there's some battle music. And I think there's half a dozen different battle musics, depending on like where you are in the narrative and kind of the environment and stuff. Um, But when you do one of those actions I talked about and how beautiful the visuals are, as far as I could tell, because like I said, I, I did not get to finish the game. As far as I could tell, it does the like no matter what's happening and no matter what environment you're in. And and the thing that made that jump out to me is I was like, oh, OK, so in the in this first fight, like it's, you know, my swords versus their axes and we're like all stabbing each other. But then very soon after that, it's like, oh, now now there's like an archer and now there's like a mage and now there's like a healer. And uh, to have the exact same high intensity dramatic music when my healer is healing my archer, like doesn't feel right. Like it, <laughs> it, it, it's awkward because when you go into uh, the little combat encounter, you're hoping for like some interesting mechanical thing to happen. You'll do, you'll crit or you'll do a weird double hit or like there, there's, tension and that's represented in the music 
when you are casting a spell, near as I can tell, spells never miss, right? So there isn't really the same tension there. And when you're healing someone or using an item, there's zero tension because that thing is just going to happen. And it's usually a thing that's good that you wanted to happen, which is why you did it. So to have (laughs) the I'm stabbing you with my sword tense battle music be the exact same music in every single little vignette robs them of their tone because visually Mm -hmm. they always make sense, right? Like when a spell is cast, it looks like a spell. And when a healing spell is cast or an item is used, it looks like that thing. And so the vignette visuals match up. The vignette music matches up half the time, I guess. (laughs) Right. Like, and that, that doesn't, it, it doesn't feel good. Like just tonally every time I cast a healing spell and it went into that dramatic music, I was just like, what am I I supposed to be feeling right now? How am I supposed to be feeling? (laughs) This music is not clearly communicating to me the feelings I'm supposed to be having. Well, it's like uh, in the episode of the Simpsons where uh, they do the X-Files parody. Um, And so Homer, you know, walks in and he's like, you know, it appears every night. And, you know, like this alien like came and and, and attacked me. And, you know, Chief Wickham goes, Okay, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and take that statement down on my invisible typewriter. Do, 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 do. And he's like, fine, you don't believe me. And then leaves. And then somebody comes in flicking a, a, a lighter, like clearly charred. He goes, I just burned down a house. I'm afraid I'm going to do it again. Oh, well, let me just take your statement down on my magical typewriter. Do, 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 fruitcake. You know, like it's like, <laughs> it's like that, where it's if you get the same response regardless of the action or visual, it feels discordant which the simpsons knew and played it for laughs this game just kind of did it and was like see and you're like oh no that doesn't make any sense right um so no i i I agreed um that's actually what it is it's it's salt it's someone was like oh when you when you have an interaction it's it's like tense because it's like you versus the enemy and that's that's someone telling you that in most circumstances it's probably okay to add a little salt. Oh, you, you got a steak? Put a little salt on that. You got some steamed vegetables? Throw a little salt on there. You got a slice of cake? Eh. I mean, like, it probably won't ruin the cake, but don't put a little salt on it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just, yeah. it's it's not, it's not like, oh, man, this game, like, this is the one failing in the game. I just, it goes to that same music every single time. And there's a lot of little vignettes because every single interaction has the little vignette. So the fact that it goes to that little musical thing every time, it just, it gets, it, it starts to drag on you. Cause I mean, you're yeah. going to hear it over the course of the whole game. Thousands of times, certainly hundreds. Yeah. I actually crunched the math on it and it's 50 million times. <laughs> exactly. Which is a, a, a design feat. I mean, I, I was impressed personally. I mean, because when it got to forty nine million nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety five, and I was like right at the end of the game, I was like, "No way, <laughs> it's impossible!" <laughs> but they did it, man. So, so kudos to them. And that's why they had to have that music in every single one, because otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten to a clean five million. It would have been like you know three million five hundred eighty nine thousand two hundred thirty two or something like that. You know, I love the implication that different music would have made this strategy game that has randomness play out totally different. No, it's, this is a solved game. This oh, is, I mean, a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It's like connect four. Yeah. Uh, I, that's all I have for audio. You got anything else? Sadly? No, which I actually feel kind of bad about because I was like, what is it with games from this era and having like, eh, sounds like, <laughs> like the spells make little chimey spell noises and, you know, like the blaze is like the first damage spell you get. And then there's like, you know, like thunder, whatever Um, that makes, you know, like they're fine. Like they make fine sound effects, but like they're not great. They're not bad. They're just like, they, they do what they're supposed they do to the job. Yeah. yeah. And I just like, I feel bad talking about somebody's work that way. Right. Like someone or a team of people, got paid to make those sound effects and like, I'm sure they did their best and like, it's fine. But like the, you know, the visuals, everybody, if you know, assuming you can see like everybody focuses on the visuals we do. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
it, it, assuming you can hear, it's really easy to focus on the music because it's like it's catchy or it's thematic or it's it's haunting or whatever. But so many sound effects in games just kind of go unremarked. And from this era in particular, like the 16 bit and back era, I feel like my main note for a lot of game sound effects is it had sound effects. <laughs> and I just it's it's a. I don't, you, you all work hard and you're all beautiful and I love you, but like, I'm sorry. I don't have more to say about your, your guy got hit noise. Like <laughs> It's just not that remarkable. You know what this, uh, this makes me think of, it makes me think of the office where, uh, um, uh, Ryan is in charge, you know, like he's the, the, the regional manager and, uh, and he's flaming out, you know? And, uh, so Jim calls him up and says like, Hey, I just got this sale. And he goes like, Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it's really, really big. It's, no, no, wait, wait, don't interrupt. Let me finish. Thank you for doing your job. Please. And he, <laughs> you know, like, it's like that. Where it's like, you know, what'd you think of the sound design? Oh, it's good. You know, oh, thank you. Why did, no, that, that, let me finish. It was good. So you did your job. You yeah, know? it was present. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, controls mechanics, right? Uh, this game's battle chess say more things <laughs> with the, the the way that it's paced and specifically the way that the visuals play out in service of that pacing it's battle chess right so basically the idea is that your pieces are laid out on the board right you see their pieces you see your pieces when you click on the piece it tells you which direction you can go and you then execute on that thing and then when you go to try to take or damage another piece it switches to a cutscene, which is why i said that, that that another game did it first battle chess did it first right um, it switches to a cutscene. It shows how that action resolves, and then it goes back to the the the, the tactics, right? So, um, game feel wise, I feel that this has a lot of. Now, it definitely, obviously, has elements that Battle Chess doesn't. Battle Chess doesn't have a narrative unless you want to like overlay one for funsies, which <laughs> actually kind of sounds pretty awesome. Um, it also doesn't have like a leveling mechanic. You know, it does have classes, um, but you know not in the same way that this game does. So there are a lot of differences, but as far as the way the pacing made me feel, like when I said like, okay, here's the map. I'm going to move this here, move this here. And Oh, there's a little cool little cutscene. Oh, this is battle chess. It just had that kind of game feel to it, which I yeah. thought was kind of which, fascinating, which sort of makes sense when you think about it. Cause there's like a, a regressive evolution thing happening, right? Where uh modern chess, what we think of as modern chess is a refinement of large mm-hmm. scale, you know, war games where it's like, Oh, we have, you know, these pieces represent foot soldiers and these pieces represent artillery or I guess archers or whatever. But like they actually did that on what would look like a giant diorama, you know? Right. And then over time that got refined down more and more to what we think of as modern chess. And then video games made it pretty easy to kind of go back in the other direction where mm-hmm. it was like, no, now we can make it more and more complicated, right? Because this is a, it's a strategy game about military maneuvers, which is what chess is, right? So, <laughs> so it, it's, it's uh, certainly not surprising they would have that similar kind of feel. I do think it's flat out ridiculous that you could start to even be, begin to make a reasonable argument that it's like, Oh yeah, the the visual feel of Shining Force actually cribbed a lot from Battle Chess because that feels <laughs> that feels wrong. That feels like dramatic <laughs> tension music during a healing spell. Like it's like you're not wrong, but I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing is, it's by no way am I asserting that you know like oh this is a one to one you know, but it, it it's is I just kind of like the like you said the big reveal of oh this is Battle Chess. No no, no wait hear me out. And it's like. It, I don't I don't like that I can't outright <laughs> reject what you just yeah. said, you know? Yeah, like, it's it. like, no, I have to I mean, yeah, I guess. Um <laughs> I'd like that to be more of a stretch than it is. <laughs> and like I said, just in, in general in terms of pacing, because that is the game that I played the ever loving mess out of, man. I played so much battle chess. And originally when I first booted up this game, um, I wasn't just I was just not in a great mood in that particular cross section of time, you know? And so I was like game's dumb why don't we just play battle chess again? <laughs> and and i was like why would anybody play this just play battle chess it's a better game and then it makes you good at chess and then i thought about it i'm like actually this game is better because of the depth of the strategy and you know and then i i, I talked myself out of it but that was the uh uh the first place that i went to um 
one of the other things that this game does uh, that I think is interesting is that experience is gained by individual action, not by necessarily they get more experience for killing monsters, but um, not necessarily by either felling a creature or it's distributed full fully to the party upon completing that, a, a battle. That That's in line with the tactics strategy games that I have played. I mean, Final Fantasy Tactics does that. True, but it is, it is a, a distinct choice. And I, I, I actually prefer that um, just because it is very much so a use the character kind of thing. And what mm-hmm. it actually makes me think of uh, more so is um, Skyrim, you know, how like in order to get good at a thing, you actually have to do the thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you want to you want to raise your jumping skill, jump around like an idiot. Yeah, you want to raise your crafting skill, like just go. To, here's a million daggers that I crafted. <laughs> Thank you. I would like Daedric armor now. Um, so, uh, so, but I, I like that as a uh, as a mechanic because, and, and I mean, Pokemon does it too, where you know if you if you don't use that Pokemon, then it doesn't gain experience, or the old, earlier ones did. And I just I don't know. I, I prefer that because if you know, if you never use that particular character, then uh, it's going to show. And then what that does is it forces the player to actually use the characters as opposed to like, well, I just kind of keep my healer off to the side and the wings just in case I need them. But, you know, I don't really play with them much. It's like, no, then they suck and they will stop being a useful thing for you. So you need to invest now in them in order to play dividends later, which is, again, good to teach. It's a good teaching tool. It's a good, uh, good, good way to actually teach strategy not just like a gamey mechanic so i i personally like that mechanic well i agree with you and i think the reason the strategy games that i've played maybe they don't all do this but the the ones that i've played all do this and or or have some version of it and i think the reason it's important compared to like a final fantasy where the whole party gets experience is these characters in shining force are not generic you know, foot soldier and archer, and we're not using their names because I don't remember most of their names because they're all dead to me, but they are like people that you're supposed to care about. So saying, oh, I just have my healer standing off to the side, gaining like, you know, splash experience when we do the real work like that makes sense when there's a party of three or four and it's, you know, JRPG style but when you're supposed to be spreading units out to the winds and like going around mountains or, or, you know, water features so that you can, you know, pincer in on your opponents. Like, it's like, no, that this is like each person is contributing in a very unique sort of way. And if they die midway through the fight, then they only earned whatever experience they earned up until the point they died. And then you got to res them later, which costs money and you can't use them for the rest of the battle. Uh, if they miss, they also still get one experience, which I thought was really nice because it doesn't take all that much experience to get a level. So they're like, hey, you know, you did a thing. You tried, buddy. Like you yeah. still, right. I, I, I think we learn more from our failures than we do our successes. But in this case, you actually learn substantially less from way your less. Yeah, <laughs> way less. Like I can actually put a number to how much less you learned. Yeah, yeah I can quantify it. Um <laughs> I do think it's interesting that JRPGs that do this uh, tend to piss me off, but in strategy games, I expect it and think it's appropriate. Uh, Persona, actually, some of, I don't know if they all do this, but uh, some of the Persona games, um, you got experience per action, like a strategy game, which means if one person carried the day, they will eventually get this like bizarre strength lead where they're just gaining levels which means they carry the day more and more and more and more right because in a jrpg style battle everyone contributes roughly the same strategy games just aren't like that and so the individualized experience feels more appropriate and tends to create balance that works better um i'm I'm thinking through this in real time here so this probably sounds pretty jank but like there is some good reason that it makes sense in one environment and super drives me nuts in the other environment. And I'm, I'm glad that this has the strategy game standard. Well, and, and um, 
while, while as you're working through that, just a, a minor, minor personal note for me. Um, yeah, I, I don't, uh, have the patience for turn-based strategy anymore, man. Like, <laughs> like it just, I don't know what it is about where I am in my life and all sorts of stuff. And, and, and the thing is that it does it is, yeah, it just, it requires a degree of patience to do, you know, turn-based strategy. And I think that it's, um, and a lot of times, because we are, we are trying to play the way we play games for this podcast is different than the way I just play games in my personal time. Right. Because I mean, for example, I really, really enjoy civilization six, but that's because, you know, I can literally one turn at a time, just kind of do put my brain in neutral and just let the game go. But when I'm actually trying to deconstruct the game, I'm like, okay, I, I understand how this battle is supposed to go. I want to move on to the next thing now. And it's like, oh no, you got like 15 more rounds in it. And, um, the, one of the other things that is inherent within turn-based strategy, but I don't think that there's a, it, this is actually a conundrum that I know a lot of game devs deal with, which is that there will come a time when you have won the battle, you just have to win the battle, you know, where like the battle's over, like you you won, you know, but the game can't recognize that because it doesn't know if you're going to start suddenly making a, a litany of terrible mistakes. So, once I've felled three out of the five orcs, I've, you know, managed to get it so that way my healers healed the appropriate people, you know, and, and I've, I've won the day and I'm like, okay, now this guy is going to deal him five damage and this person's going to do this and this person's going to do that. Do that. Uh, I wish there was like a button to like speed up the text on that. And, and, and there's not, you just have to work your way through it. But I feel that, that when the game, when each individual puzzle does become a solved puzzle, um, that becomes a little bit tedious for me. And uh, that, that is, is a problem yeah. that this game suffers from. And I don't, I don't know exactly how to do that in a game like this, where it would feel good. Um, but I, I think a good example of the kind of thing you're talking about is uh, in earthbound, when you are so much more powerful than the enemy monsters when you, cause you know, the enemy monsters are on the overworld map. And so you, you touch them and then it takes you into the JRPG style battle when you're more powerful enough that you will definitely win in the first round, the screen just flashes white and it says you won. And then it tells you how much experience you gained, how much money you got. Right. And it's, it just takes some of the grindy frustration out of backtracking and it's a fun little reward for getting super powerful in the game, right? It's just like, yeah, we're not even going to waste your time with these low level enemies. How you would take that same kind of concept and apply it to a strategy game. I don't know, but I think what you're getting at is I don't just want to ha- feel like my time is not being wasted. I feel like my time is being wasted because this is not fun or interesting. I am just going through the motions. So either make it fun, make it interesting, or don't make me go through the motions. But I would actually think of them in that order, right? Just letting me skip out on the rest of the battle entirely feels like the worst of those options. Like, do something to make me feel super powerful as I'm, like, blasting through the remaining enemies because my brilliant strategy put me in this unassailable position right like let that feel super triumphant um or make it super fast or something but like don't just don't make me go through the motions with the same pomp and circumstance and sense of drama as when i didn't know the outcome the outcome is now determined and yet the game is still like oh what's gonna happen it's like i'm gonna win i'm gonna win in 15 minutes because it takes 15 minutes to get from here to there, not because there's 15 minutes worth of problems to solve. Yeah, no, I, I agreed. And, and the, the, the other end of that spectrum that you can run the risk of is that if you add in so much randomness to your turn-based strategy, to, to what, where you're like, yeah, I got this handled, no problem. And then all of a sudden they're like, yes, but now the swamp monster appears. Whoa, you know, it's like, well... All right. I mean, like if, if I start to win handily, if you just snap me back to reality with clear rubber band physics, then that's not fun either. You know, so um, I and, and again, I never really felt that way with um, so much with uh, uh, 
Final Fantasy Tactics, and I'll, I'll have to, to, to reflect on why. I don't really have a good answer for that. I do feel... I think I know why. Oh, why? Go for it. Yeah. So one of my main issues with the battles in this game, uh, I actually alluded to pretty damn strongly in visuals, which is uh, the maps are huge. Everything is so spread out. But that's actually why I have I, 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 I didn't realize it. I have that note here in this part where I said um, battles can start with baddies and possibly far away. Yes. So, yeah. And, and so here's here's the thing. Um, let me quickly try to summarize some of the mechanics of the game. Uh, combat like melee people can hit, you know, north, south, east, west. Um, archers can hit north, south, east, west two squares, but not the closest square, right? So they have a slightly larger range. Uh, Spellcasters, depending on the spell that they're casting, sometimes it's just one square away. Sometimes it's a little bit further. Um, And then the spells actually go up in levels. So then they get uh, area of effect, right? This this the blaze spells, the first attack spell you get, and it goes up in level pretty early. So it goes from targeting one spell to targeting a cross, right? So five possible enemies can be impacted. Here's where the space of things starts to cause issues for me. You can't move that far. Most actions, you have to be directly next to the person you're acting on, including things like using items, casting a lot of the healing spells. Like you have to be directly adjacent to the, the, the enemy or, or party member that you're acting on. And because the battle maps are huge you spend a lot of time just getting your soldiers to the opposite side of the field and loading your muskets while they're getting their soldiers to the opposite side of the field and loading their muskets and this is another place where like tonally it fell down for me where i was just like there's no tension in this because it's not like oh we're i'm 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 casting buffs and I'm using one time use items and we're getting properly aligned so that my archers have the high ground. And so that my using yell 15 times so that way I can get that stat higher, all that stuff. Right. So, so my (laughs) spellcasters are like in the right position. There's none of that. And maybe that all comes in, in the super late game and I just didn't get there and I'm totally wrong, but it sure as hell is not there in the early game or the mid game, the early game and the mid game. It is uh, what (laughs) someone I was talking to about this game described as peewee soccer the strategy is peewee soccer you try to get one enemy to stupidly isolate themselves and then you swarm them and you all beat them to death and then you swarm the next enemy and then you beat them to death just the way little kids when they play soccer they don't properly play their position they just all swarm the ball like Mm. that is Mm -hmm. how that is the only way i found reliable success and that's what the cpu does the CPU attempts to swarm you and then swarm somebody else and then swarm somebody else. And they, sometimes they make intentionally stupid decisions to like soften your mistakes, but you have these huge spread out maps. You have characters that cannot move particularly far on a given turn and that they have to be directly next to an enemy that they're going to act on or, you know, two squares away. And so you just end up having this feeling where like you spend a lot of time walking just a lot of time walking and i think you spend so much of your (laughs) i think you spend so much of your emotional energy on lining up on your side of the field getting ready to fire your muskets that once the day is won and you're now it's like that scene in 300 where you're just going around just like stabbing guys and like putting them out of their misery like that doesn't feel super triumphant it's just this slow boring mechanical slog because lining up at the edge of the field active combat and finishing the job all have the same pace. They all have the same like snare drum, you know, kind of Mm. 50 beats per minute pace there. There's no, um, there's no like squash and stretch. There's no like buildup of anticipation and then a big explosive firework. Like each phase of the battle moves at the same pace. And that, eventually is boring and then and then once the battle's won it you're very aware of that boringness yeah no i i I agree and and thank you for for solving that that particular issue with me so to (laughs) to to jump off of that i think then what the main issue becomes is that 
in Final Fantasy Tactics, the reward was intrinsic. Uh, in this game, the rewards, rewards extrinsic. You play this game because you want to gain higher levels or you want to see the rest of the story or whatever is involved behind the gate of playing the game, you know? Um, whereas in Final Fantasy Tactics, like the actual tactical situations were interesting because you're like, well, how how high? Because, I mean, they had different terrain heights, right? So you're like, well, how high is this terrain height? This person, this this, this map is like short and squashed and super long, you know? So how am I going to deal with that? Okay, well, well, I should get this guy lined up here because this is my monk and, and he can do these things, you know? Um, you know, this person can can do the, you know, whereas this one, it's like, you know, like you said, just just get walk from point A to point B. So when I won the battle i was like when i won the battle battle in final fantasy tactics and actually we have a a, a great exemplar for this i was excited to play the next battle and we know that because i got to like level 80 before i got past the first map you know and yes part of that was grinding just because i love i like walking through a game when they're like you'll never defeat this guy he is the lord of this local town you're like i'm a golden god so (laughs) yeah i think i got this you know like that I'm going to deck him in the schnoz. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that being said, is that if the game was not intrinsically rewarding, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have been able to, to tolerate it. And so I think that, that the gameplay itself is not amazing. You play, and, and to be fair, th- that's, there, there are tons of people who say, you know, like who will grind, you know, and they, they, they love doing it. There are people who are, perfectly happy playing a game for extrinsic rewards and there is nothing wrong with that right however if the game is not intrinsically rewarding then i tend to kind of check out because again when you've got two hours a a week to play video games you don't want to spend it on something where at the end of it you can say these got all of these numbers on this artificial sheet went up it's like man i can open up a spreadsheet and make numbers go higher if i want to you know so um so yeah so i think that you're right is that the game is not intrinsically rewarding well and this is what is like i would say the the problem with this game overall is the scale is off right there are places where visually the scale felt off there are places uh orally where it's like oh this is the wrong amount of tension for this like thing that's happening so like the scale of the stakes feels off and mechanically there are a lot of places where the scale feels off because uh in like the mid mid late so like you know above the 50 percent mark and into the end of the game there are places where your characters have leveled up and gotten new abilities enough and the terrain is varied enough that even with the kind of simplistic set of strategic options you have There's enough going on that you're like, well, you know, this this narrow pathway, I can only get like two two people side by side to go through there. So I really got to be thoughtful about the order I send my people through there, because if we get bottlenecked, we're going to it'll be just like 300. Right. We're going to get murdered. Um, If you, uh, you know, start to get the spells with area of effect and, and like you get better archers and stuff like you can eventually start to do some things that are interesting tactically. But like the whole first quarter to third of the game has basically none of that and so just like the battle maps are too spread out like the interesting tactical strategic stuff is also spread too thin like like butter scraped across too much bread like it's just it's spread out because it's there and if you got to it way the hell ass sooner i think that would actually have improved my my experience of the game tremendously because I, I'm I'm with you, right? Like it's it you do approach a game differently when you are critiquing it and reviewing it, and you know playing a 30 hour strategy game is a very different kind of experience than someone necessarily has time for in their life, depending on like their work and their family and their other hobbies and everything else. I I don't want to count those things against the design of the game itself, but I can absolutely count holding the delicious bits and the interesting bits too long, right? I mean, imagine if you played halfway through a a Zelda-like game before you got to your first, like, head-scratcher puzzle because all the other puzzles were just like, oh, push this one block. You're like, no, that 
like, yeah, there's interesting puzzles, but I got to go through 10 hours a game to get to them. Th- this is exactly like that. It's like, oh, so I can use the all the five year old swarm the soccer ball strategy for like five to 10 hours before that's not going to be enough. And then when it's not enough, I haven't really been practicing more interesting strategies because why would I have been right? Right. And, and so that that feels like that's not me. That's not me being in a rush. That's not you being busy with work. That's not our kids being distracting. Like that's the game taking what should have been 15 hours worth of interesting battle experiences and stretching it to 25, which means you spend too much time walking across the map in general, like each individual map and the map of the game. You spend too much time walking across the battle map. Um, I've got just a couple of real quick throwaway things for, for, uh, controls mechanics and then I'm out. Um, uh, it is one of them. This game has the shittest inventory management. <laughs> uh, you kind of, I, I said that you have to buy items one at a time. Um, which is weird, or at least that's, was my experience. It, it was my experience as well. And they go into the inventory of the main character and the, each uh, person can only hold four things. So you have to buy things and then distribute them amongst the party. So you can correct. then buy more. Thi- oh God, it's the worst. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like when the PlayStation store first launched. So you had to like put money into your PlayStation account, you know? So it's like walking into a store and it's like, Hey, I'd like to buy this video game. Okay. Here's $50. No, no, no. You can't do that. It's like, but I want to pay for the video game. Yeah. Put your money in this bucket. Okay. I confirm that you have your money in this bucket. Okay. Now, can I buy the game? No. Take the money out of the bucket. Now <laughs> hand it to me. And it's like, why is any of this happening? You know? No, I, I agreed 100%. So yeah, the, the uh, buy items one at a time, inventory management nightmare. Um, you have to be facing in the direction of the person to talk to them. That was just... a <laughs> mild annoyance you know and i get and and it does the early rpg thing of like there's a talk menu yeah yeah but like to me you know we and again like i get that in real life you have to be facing people to talk (laughs) to them generally speaking or at least it conveys a completely different tone when you start a conversation (laughs) or try to conclude one while not facing somebody you know um but didn't like it because there are a couple times where i was like come on talk talk that's right and i turned to them um and also there's no pause button. Is there a pause button? I don't think so, but the the I mean you can just sit and do nothing when you it's can. your turn. I mean and that's and that's fine. Like yeah. there's a, a soft pause, but literally because I mean I was playing this this game on uh on the Switch, you know, um for this one and and I was like, okay. And it was just habit. So I just pressed the, the, the plus button and nothing happened. And I was like, huh. And again, I could just press home or just turn the console off. I mean, like there's a million different ways to deal with this problem that I just wouldn't like, wait a minute. And then literally pressed all of the buttons. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I guess there doesn't have to be a pause function, but I, 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 there's something that makes me feel a little bit nicer about putting the bookmark in the book and then closing the book. You know, it's like, you well, why don't you just turn the book on its side and just leave it where you left it there? There's no one's going to mess with your book. And I'm like, and I get that. I live by myself. The book's open on the counter. I don't have it. There's nothing that's going to disturb this book, but it's just not. No, you put the bookmark in the book and you close it, put it away, you know? So, uh, yeah, just weird. Um, that's it. <laughs> I, I, my, my two other throwaway notes are, uh, why are churches always save points? What's up with that? Where, where did that come from? Um, <laughs> because because when you enter it you are saved I hate you so much <laughs> <laughs> god damn it um <laughs> whoa <laughs> yeah i once again have unfortunately no way to argue with that uh, <laughs> so just you're just gonna give me zero stars on yelp like, would not <laughs> recommend. Much. uh when you go to talk to the priest um his blink animation is backwards instead of his eyes mostly being open and then blinking quickly, <laughs> they're closed and then they flash open and then reclose. Ugh. Which is just, so, a, it's just a funny bug. No, he's trying to, he's trying to um, pretend to be like the blind priest who knows everything, <laughs> but he like sucks at it, you know? So he's like, yes, I see without seeing. And he like opens <laughs> and closes his eyes real fast. And you're like, wait, did you just look? It's like, no, it was an illusion. It's like Drax eating the potato chips. It's like, but if I move so slowly, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I mean, sure. Head cannon accepted. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, uh, the, my, my one other throwaway thing is, uh, I love in games where there's, you like recruit a large force, the dead giveaway of this person has a character portrait. Therefore, like they have value as a person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With a character portrait like that, I'm guessing you've never lost the game of who's the pro tag. Yeah. Right. It's just, just like, you know, especially with the sprites looking the way they do. And it's like not immediately obvious, like who generic villager is until you've seen them a thousand times. But when you walk up to somebody and talk to them and their little character portrait shows up and it's like, we're going to be seeing more of each other. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to join my thing. Maybe not right now. Maybe I got to go do some story beat before you'll join my thing, but you're, you're coming with me. Well, and that's why I try to always dress in a somewhat distinctive style because have you ever been with like a, a group of people, you know, like a small group, like six or whatever. And you kind of like look around and you're like, man, if, if all of a sudden the murderer came in, like who would survive the longest? And there's two different rule sets, right? Because there's the horror movie rule rule set where like, I'm, I'm out in, in the very beginning, right? You know, like both of us are like, we're, we're both, you know, like athletic, you know, like, like, you know, white dudes, we, we, we go out while, while we're having sex with our wives. Right. You know, like just <laughs> like, that's what happens. It's like, we're doing that. And then all of a sudden the killer is like, Ooh, you know, like, so, so that's old school horror movie trope. But the other way to do it is, is to, to again, like, like look at visual styles and say, okay, who's the pro tag. Uh, let's see. Who, it's, who it's, has pink hair and an earring. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and, and when you, when, when there's somebody in that in the group, you're like, Hey, why don't you go find another group? <laughs> That's why uh, that that's really the whole thing behind like punk rock, right? Is they're like, no, we're rebelling against the machine. And it's like, you just want to be the main character of this story. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, agreed. So uh, what do you think, man? Did it hold up? Uh, I, I, I've been struggling with some of these games that like, I was like, ah, oh, I always wanted to go back and take this really seriously. And then I do. And then I'm like, eh, um, so here's where I fell down for Shining Force, the whatever weird subtitle is. Um, I'm giving this game a nostalgia monocle. And the reason is it's doing a lot of interesting things. It just takes too long to do them. And I think if you wanted to play a strategy game and you don't have really fond memories of Shining Force really hard to say, Oh, you should go play shining force unless that person can just let this breathe. Right. When, when someone is dying of thirst, you don't say like, Oh no, you got to let it breathe a little before you, you know, save yourself of dehydration. Um, not that I think everything should be given to you like weird Al style fire hose, but there are some quality of life improvements that newer strategy games have where it's just like, they balanced it a little better. You know, it's their modern games are not terrified to have shorter experiences where it's like, yeah, we had 10 hours of game, So the game is 10 hours long, right? If you have 50 hours of game or a hundred hours of game, fine. Like I've easily sunk well over a hundred hours into Stardew Valley because that, to me, that game has over a hundred hours worth of game. But this game to me is because I looked it up, like how long to beat rated this at about 20 hours. And I was like, eh, it should be like 12, like, chop out a lot of nonsense and make everything take a little bit less time. And that like tightening up is more it's editing, right? It it needed better editing before they shipped it. Not that it's like, Oh, I'm impatient and it's so long and slow. So I think the game does interesting things, but because there's no way around how big the battle maps are and how long and slow and stretched out, everything is just by nature of it being a strategy game on top of the other issues, nostalgia monocle. Like I would love to have the space to let this breathe and like really just say like, okay, I'm just going to put the full 20 hours into it. Cause I was enjoying it. Like once the strategy started to have strategy and once there started to be interesting things going on, I was like, yeah, this is, I could see playing this all the way through, but where the hell am I going to find the goddamn time? So <laughs> nostalgia monocle is what I had to settle on. And, and I agree with you. I think that uh nostalgia monocle is the way to go because I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, which is, you know, if somebody said, Hey, should I go play shining force? I'd be like, uh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't 
do anything truly novel, you know? Um, so why? I, I, I think that um, one of the things that a brief aside is that, you know, my wife and I have uh, differed on a number of times, which is that like, I believe that in order to keep a thing, you have to justify keeping it, right? And she believes in order to throw away a thing, you have to justify throwing it out. I think that you have to justify playing a game, you know? So if somebody said to me, you know, hey, I'm going to play Shining Force, I'd say, uh, you know, why? You know, why are you playing that game? If the answer isn't, I played it before and I want to play it again, because it's like, yeah, great, go for it. If the answer is, oh, you know, I I really like turn-based strategy. It's like, then here is a list of turn-based strategy games that you should play before before Shining Force. Oh, I really like, uh, you know, I hear it does some interesting visual things. It does. Here are some games that do it better, you know? Um, yeah, it just, it it's it's not bad. You know, I'm not going to, you know, kick it out of my office for, for violating company policy. But at the same point in time, like if, you know, again, on a, on, a, on a review, right, I'd give this a meets expectations, right? You know, where it's like, you know, you didn't do anything stellar. You didn't wow me. So I'm not going to fire you. But at the same point in time, you're getting cost of living raise and and that's it that you know which is a bummer because when uh when i booted this thing up i really wanted to be shiny the curtain falls the music plays the credits roll then it all fades to black and you're left by yourself the fanfare is gone there's no player to there by your side to share victories won But as you slowly progress Down the hall to your bed A few great events Leak back into your head From the time that you spent Traversing the land Battling evil Fighting the darkness Just sword in hand Your memories creep in With the edge of a smile 